Reflections with theologian Father James Basic, lecturer and campus minister at the University of Toledo. It's sort of not in or not done. I mean, while we have taken certain other taboo topics such as sexuality and begun to talk more openly and freely about them, it is really hard to enter into conversation about the topic of death. Today on Reflections, Father Basic talks with Father Kenneth Mormon, theologian and secretary, priest personnel board for the Diocese of Toledo. Father Basic and Father Mormon will discuss the agony in the garden facing the mystery of death. And now, here is Father Basic. Ken, I'm glad to have a scripture scholar come and uh, join me in uh, conversation here because I want to talk about the very large question of facing death, very difficult thing, but especially to do so in the light of uh, the certain scripture passages, especially from the 12th chapter of John's Gospel. So I'll be looking for a good deal of help from you along that line. But uh, I want to uh, begin by making sure we sort of have this problem in mind, uh, the whole idea of facing death. In, in this 12th chapter of John's Gospel, uh, there is talk of this great moment when Jesus has to face his own death. And uh, of course, that is something that eventually we all have to do. Perhaps we come at it a lot of times in terms of facing the death of loved ones first, and then uh, always with that other thing in background. Uh, I might start out by just saying that that appears to be a problem in our culture. We all know there's a lot of escaping from uh, the problem of death. I think a lot of the youth culture runs on that, we, and a lot of our inability to deal with older people who remind us of bodily limitations and so on. That might be part of it. found myself visiting the hospital last night and getting a little squeamish in uh, dealing with uh, some people who were uh, suffering. So I, I think that that's something that we need to look at. Do you want to comment on that at all? I think you're quite correct. I think that maybe one of the reasons why that's the case is that it raises the issue of why we have life at all, what life is for. Um, as long as one, one can just go with the flow and not think about much at all, when you're faced with death and the ending of it, that brings the question home, well, what was it for? What is it for? And what are the implications of that for the way I live now? In indeed. I, I always think of the philosopher Martin Heidegger in this regard, who said that we could never become truly authentic people until we were able to say, yes, I will die. Many people think of that as a morbid kind of philosophy, but for actually for Heidegger, it, it meant that if I'm able to face my death as a given boundary in my life, that therefore each moment as I go along will have greater significance. True. And, and I think there really is a lot of um, wisdom in that, in that whole line of thought. And yet it culturally becomes so hard for us, uh, and uh, psychically as well. I think there are cultures who seem to have a more positive outlook on death than we do. They talk more freely about it. They prepare better for it. They're with their people when they die. And, and so on. But uh, for us, very often, it, I think it has become a major kind of problem. I think that's true. I think maybe that might be tied up to some degree with the, uh, the consumer aspect of our, of our culture. If you are in co constantly encouraging people, if you build your, um, your, your livelihood on making sure that other people consume things that you're producing, then of course to talk about the end of that process is only going to be a negative thing. You want to talk about the quality of life now. You want to push on what you can do and what you want to do and what, having things that, that you would uh, like to have. All those elements push away any uh, consideration of death and, and fasten upon the, the goodness of life right here and now. It's, again, when you look at the end of the death that you see, or the end of life, when, namely death, that you see what all life is for and whether it has a purpose beyond getting what I want here and now and being satisfied with the things that appeal to me here and now. Yes, and uh, that begins to give a larger perspective exactly. on the question, for sure. So we've got those cultural factors. I think that also, Ken, it's just a matter that it's sort of not in or not done. I mean, while we have taken certain other taboo topics such as sexuality and begun to talk more openly and freely about them, it is really hard to enter into conversation about the topic of death. I think that in our profession as uh, priests and uh, ministers of the gospel and 
encountering people who are actually dying, we probably are blessed in a way. We learn some things that maybe most people don't hear. We, we've come to learn, for example, that, that people who are dying often know it and feel a need to talk about it. And very often relatives will be there trying to cheer them up or keep them happy and make it light and frothy and so on. Whereas uh, there is a real psychic need on the part of people who are dying to, to talk about that, to begin to make some sense out of it and maybe to look for strength in dealing with it. So perhaps we see something there that the average person very often isn't, isn't open to because in general conversation, I mean, it's just not in to talk about death. You don't do that at the average cocktail party. And I suppose there is sort of a morbidity about it in a sense. And a proper sensitivity that says you don't do that. But if in the culture as a whole, there's really not many uh, forums at all for doing that, then we're, uh, we are all impoverished. So what I'm suggesting is that not only is it this sort of materialistic affluent side of it, but it's simply almost a habit. That is, it, because it isn't done, we don't have a forum, and therefore we don't get used to it. There's no expectation that we talk about it, and therefore we don't, uh, we're impoverished in one way or another. I think that's true. I think there's another connection as well with, um, I, I sense a real unwillingness of people to be gullible these days. I think one of the, maybe ne people never wanted to be gullible, but um, a real hesitancy to be taken or to uh, have be discovered in having put their hopes or their beliefs in something that turned out to be faulty. I think that when you come to the moment of, or the consideration of death, you're exactly at that uh, point in which you have to take a stand one way or another. Either there's a, something beyond that point or there is not. And because people, um, uh, perhaps in an, in an inauthentic form of faith, uh, some people would hope for a half, an afterlife as a way of denying the reality of death, uh, and people don't want to be caught into that uh, bind, they are hesitant to express a, a belief or a faith beyond, or the, in something that exists beyond death because they don't want to be found gullible. But if that's the case, then there's nothing to talk about. And so in those uh, situations that you just described, when a person is dying, all one can talk about is this side of, the, of that uh, boundary, and that becomes very meaningless very quickly, seems trivial and, and unimportant, because the person who's actually going through the experience is going to cross that divide, and now what lies on the other side is a, of immense importance, and uh, for friends and relatives not to face that and not to face up to that, uh, does not meet his, the dying person's needs in any respect. I wonder if the certain scientism, an attitude that uh, only that which is empirically verifiable is exactly. worthwhile or can be truthful doesn't play into all of that. Exactly. You no, know, even when we do start to talk about death, it's interesting. In one, uh, s some circles, it is in terms of freezing bodies, you know. Uh, in other words, it, it's thought of as a technological problem rather than uh, what I would call a mystery that needs to be grappled with, wrestled with, and prayed over if we're going to deal with it adequately. So it's, it would seem that maybe scientism actually plays into the hands of the problem and uh, reinforces this denial of death in our culture. So I'm saying that, I'm thinking of the book Ernst Becker, The Denial of Death, isn't that the title of it? Uh, you know, that where people have examined this whole question from many viewpoints, and uh, Becker very personally to, to say the, the pressures to end up not looking at this crucial part of what it is to be human. Oh, precisely. Well said. The, um, Ken, let's uh, start to look a little bit at um, the, our scriptures. Uh, our contention is always that the scriptures uh, illumine us, that they uh, tell us about the human condition, that uh, this is God's revelation to us, helping us to understand who we are, where we fit. Um, clearly, we would have an initial expectation that the scriptures would deal with the large questions of meaning and purpose, and thus uh, eventually bring us to a, a confrontation with death. And I think when we turn to the scriptures, we're not disappointed in that, although we will see a clear progression in ideas throughout the scriptures, because as we know in the earlier strains of the Hebrew scriptures, we, we don't find a notion of an afterlife. That becomes only later. I don't know when you date it these days. When I was studying it, it was back around 150 B.C., that book of wisdom, when we began to get notions along that line. That's right. Are they still thinking in those terms? Yes, there's adumbrations before that, but the full signification, you're correct. It's around that, around yes. that time, uh-huh. Yeah. And of course, then in the in the Christian scriptures, we find uh, this problem, you know, really 
clarified a great deal for us in terms of the death and resurrection of Jesus. So, in other words, I was trying to make a general point that the great human questions are dealt with in the scriptures. You want to comment on that at all to begin with? I mean, that we can read the Bible in many different ways, uh, but that certainly is one of them, that uh, we find authors there dealing with what counts. That's right. I, you're, you're quite correct in that, and I think maybe the passages that you have just uh, mentioned here are particularly helpful in that regard because they, uh, they deal with uh, Jesus' approach to uh, his fast approaching death. And I think there's a tendency because of our faith in Jesus as being the Son of God that um, sets him apart as though he that kind of weakens his humanity as though he didn't really go through what we go through. And therefore, be, he, uh, especially in John's Gospel, is presented as being in charge, is always in control. Uh, I lay down my own life. No one takes it from me, he says in John's Gospel. Uh, the, the danger of that kind of uh, speaking is that it gives the impression that maybe Jesus didn't have any struggle at all in facing his death. That it was simple for him. Whereas we uh, really go through a, uh, a conflict or some um, uh, turbulence in dealing with uh, the specter of our own death, Jesus didn't have that problem. Well, I think the, the passages that uh, we've mentioned this, this, uh, in this particular segment um, speak very clearly of, uh, of a real trauma that Jesus went through. Let me read case. you one of those, uh, Ken, and, and allow you to comment on it. This is from uh, Hebrews 5, 7 to 9. Uh, the letter to the to Hebrews being, um, you know, I read a distinctive piece in, in the New Testament, which I take it as trying to show that in general that Jesus is the high priest and our great mediator and so on. But here's an interesting passage. It says in the fifth chapter of Hebrews, in the days when Christ was in the flesh, Jesus walking the earth, I take it. He offered prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to God, who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverence. Now, I know that the scripture scholars think that that refers to the agony in the garden, and I think it begins to respond to your point that uh, there is this perception that Jesus, you know, was above the fray in a sense, that he didn't have the dark moments and didn't have to struggle with this great mysterious thing we know as death. Here we see an opposite sort of thing portrayed. That's right. And the Synoptic Gospels uh, concur with that completely. They show a picture of Jesus. Uh, maybe I should uh, say it for a moment, and just putting that passage of uh, Hebrews in context, what the author is trying to show there is that Jesus makes an excellent mediator between God and man because he is chosen, deputed by God, God's son, etc. And yet from the human side of the uh, equation, he has suffered everything that we have suffered. He knows what human beings are like, not because he's read it in a book somewhere, but because he personally went through it and uses this, uh, those particular lines that you just read there uh, come from uh, the part of the argument where he is showing that Jesus also went through even the depths of human suffering and human gra uh, grappling with our humanity and our, our, our finitude, our not being eternal in our, in our humanity and that uh, he came through those ex that experience and therefore is able to be compassionate and understanding of us in our weakness, as I say, because he has experienced it himself. In other words, the author of the book of Hebrews is doing precisely what we think needs done here. <laughs> that, that's his purpose, huh? to right. show us that Jesus went through these things. And, and there's no doubt in your mind that this does refer to the agony in the garden then, when it talks about Jesus with loud cries and tears to God, and um, he recognizes uh, this whole struggle, in other words, that Jesus went through. That's right. It, I, would, I suppose I would say it this way, that there's, that's the only element that, of Jesus' life that we know from the Gospels that would fit that kind of description. I see. And therefore, uh, by a process of elimination, that's what we assume he was talking to. Mm -hmm. Loud cries and lamentations and so forth, that this seems to be the event. And that brings us back to the synoptics and, the, and those portrayals of the agony in the garden and so on. L let me give you one of my own fanciful readings of that. Uh, um, and uh, I envision Jesus in the agony in the garden uh, dealing with this kind of problem that he senses that he has not completed his mission of establishing the kingdom, which was his life project, the thing he had devoted himself to completely. And he's sensing that he's not going to get enough time to do it because he's uh, in great danger for his own life. And that therefore what sets up the tension for Jesus here is not so much the physical suffering and, and having to die, but more the notion that the death is going to cut his project short, that it doesn't seem like he's made the kind of progress he would want to make on it, and in fact it's rather in shambles at this point, and he's running out of time. 
And therefore, death comes to him as a terrible specter, as a kind of boundary that comes too soon. And that that, that, that becomes the thing. I almost hear his, his pray, prayer to God saying, let this chalice pass from me. He's saying, God, give me a little more time. You know, with more time and uh, here I can pull this off. I can get this, uh, this kingdom going like you want it to be, the kingdom of justice and peace. Well, as I say, I offer this as a sort of fanciful reading here, which I think is legitimate to do that with the scriptures. And I think very often the despair accounts uh, and, you know, this sort of um, implication in this reading allows the imagination to work a little like that. That's right. And uh, as long as it's based in the, in the reality of the, of the text that we have, there's uh, excellent grounding for it. And in this case, there is grounding for that kind of uh, interpretation because um, we, what we find both in Galilee and in Jerusalem is that Jesus' mission has, for all, from all external appearances, been a failure. He's not been accepted. In Galilee, he has huge crowds of people follow him, but they're following him for the wrong reason. They're interested in the, in the clever tricks that he can do and, and watching the show, but they're not changing their hearts. And uh, particularly some of the things that Luke says in his gospel um, can be interpreted as a very um, discouraging set of remarks. Uh, the disciples come back to Jesus when he sends them out on their mission and said uh, that uh, they were all excited because they cast out demons in Jesus' name and they were able to cure people and so forth. And Jesus responds, yes, I saw Satan fall from heaven while you were gone. And that can be taken as a positive comment, but it also can be taken as a, as a kind of a discouraging remark that uh, don't get so excited. You know, you really, we really have not accomplished it yet. They may have been, they may have had these good reactions, but the the kingdom of the the counter kingdom is still very strong. People have not changed their minds. He goes to get to Jerusalem, and again the same kind of uh, reactions. The crowds uh, are always there, very attentive. They, he's something of a mystery to them, trying to figure him out. But the um, officialdom knows that he's a dangerous, and for that reason is going to, they're going to get rid of him. So I think part, as you mentioned, is the, uh, the time factor, that the boundary is coming too quickly. The other thing that I think maybe, uh, again, uh, each of us perhaps reads into these texts, um, the, the elements that impress us the most, what r impresses me was the fact that Jesus' understanding of his mission runs so counter to everything that his culture, everything that his religious um, teachers, uh, those who had authority in his society, told him and the, and the people around him should be his mission if he is the Messiah, that he really stands alone in that understanding of his mission. Rather than being the, the conquering uh, hero on a, on a white horse who throws out the uh, occupying forces with military force, he understands his role in the light of the suffering servant, to give up his life uh, for the people, that the, the climax, the end times, are only going to come through that kind of, uh, of sacrifice. That's a very dangerous, dangerous gamble to make. Um, what if I'm wrong? What if all these other people are right? He has had uh, many indications in the course of his ministry that the Father is with him, and then he uses that as his um, support in these times. But again, when you're at the boundary, when now it comes uh, to the crunch, that the loneliness of that decision is certainly uh, much, in, much in, uh, at issue. Maybe I ought to just... All he would have to do was to withdraw from his claims, withdraw from his mission, just go home to Nazareth for a while, and or Capernaum for a while, and things would die down. He could have more years of quiet working with people. It's only if he continues to press the points that he's pressing with the, the Jerusalem authorities that he is making this uh, confrontation inevitable. I like that interpretation, Ken. I, I, the e uh, essence of it, as I hear it, is that uh, is the interpretation of the kingdom and interpretation of his role, which is misunderstood by everyone around Correct. him, and that uh, he really needs to have great trust in God at this point, that he's on target, and that he is indeed seeing the mission properly. Now, uh, in the Synoptic Gospels, as you suggested, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we get this agony in the garden portrayed, right? That's correct. And uh, more clearly, and that's what we get our notion of, and it's Jesus' term. confrontation with death, and we, the dynamics, as I see it, is don't make me go through this for whatever reason, whether you know we've offered some possibilities here, but it's too soon, or it's not right, it's going to mess up, and... Uh, the whole scheme of things here. So let this chalice pass from me, this strong thing. But then the more positive notion, but Father, not my will, but thine be done. Then we get the submission side of it. The, the, the more positive side, he's going to face the death. 
In other words, he becomes a countercultural figure for us at this point, considering everything that we were saying before. In our culture, we don't want to face that. It's hard to look at it. We don't want to see the consequences of getting old and of facing the boundary and death. And Jesus comes on here with the same struggle, the same anxieties that we might end up knowing, but coming through positively, not my will but thine be done. That's very true. I think that... Um all our, on the instinctual level, the whole um, dynamism of the organism is for self-preservation, that the self is the highest value. And what we find Jesus doing in a scene like this is making the opposite proclamation. No, even myself is for someone else, for something else, uh, for the Father's will to carry out the goal that he has in mind uh, for his people, that which Jesus is now dedicating his life to. The, he still goes through that same struggle. Father, save me from this hour. Father... Uh, let this cup pass from me. But in each case, the prayer ends the same. Um, not my will, but yours be done. Never, uh, nevertheless, Father, glorify your name. Let it happen. Uh, I'm willing to give my life for the purpose that you have uh, set for my life. And in that, I mean, he really stands as the great model of faith for us. That's right. And of, of trust, finally, that, that uh, God is in charge and that God will... Uh, bring it out, that it will bring the good out of the evil, bring the life out of the death. Now, Ken, there, in John's Gospel, we um, have in this 12th chapter, verses 20 to 33, that's a long passage, I don't want to read it all, but I think it's referring to the same thing. Jesus says at one point, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified, the Son of Man being one of the terms he uses for himself. And then the interesting phrase, I solemnly assure you, unless the grain of wheat falls to the earth and dies, it remains just a grain of wheat. But if it dies, it produces much fruit. So I think we're getting here this essence of the Christian message, the Paschal mystery, the death leading to resurrection. And Jesus is seeing the hour of death as the moment of glorification. That's right. Uh, Paul uses the very same image. He uses it in a different way, but uses the same image in the, the first letter to the Corinthians, that uh, it's an analogy from nature that Jesus uses. You can almost hear him expressing his, the, his own conviction by this, that He'd rather not have to die in order for this to accomplish, to be accomplished. But in fact, that is the way God has made the world. It's what Father's will is for him as well. He has to die in order to be able to bring forth this great fruit. As long as the seed remains a pristine seed, a uh, grain, uh, whole and entire, that's all it ever will remember, remain, all it will ever be. It just remains alone, is what the mm -hmm. Greek says there. It's only when it stops being a grain and starts to sprout and be a plant that then it's able to bring forth all this uh, other, uh, many other grains, many other uh, much larger fruit. And the same thing is true of Jesus as well. It's his conviction that he needs to go through this process in order for the, the God's will to be accomplished for his people to come to life uh, through his death and resurrection. So this becomes, a, you were making the point earlier that we need perspective in dealing with death. And uh, here I think we get the, the great Christian perspective on it, right? We get the essence of the gospel message that it is through death that resurrection occurs. It is through the emptying out that God can produce the greater fullness. And, and I think the message is that Jesus went through this, the, becomes uh, the first of those to be saved, and that this is our own fate as well if we can retain that kind of fidelity. That's right. I guess I, I'd like to make another point in this whole thing, and that is, it was an insight that's not original with me. Father Ray Brown made the, and it had an insight which uh, struck me as very interesting. He points out that, as, as you mentioned and as many scholars uh, have said, that this scene in the Gospel of John is equivalent to that agony in the garden scene in the synoptic Gospels. Um, whereas in the synoptics, we see the pain and the, the suffering, the anguish, the, uh, the turmoil of soul so strongly. In John's Gospel, he says his soul is overwhelmed, is uh, stirred up and, and troubled, but it seems very calm by comparison. And uh, Ray Brown made the comment that uh, some people would perhaps make the spontaneous assumption that John has taken the synoptics accounts and kind of um, streamlined it and smoothed it out and made it much more uh, palatable. And his insight was maybe it's the other way around, that as the synoptics tell the story, Jesus went apart to say his prayer to the Father and that people didn't hear what he said that what the synoptics present as Jesus' words at that time are an interpretation of what his stance was toward the Father. And, and uh, Ray makes the suggestion, may be grasped pre precisely from other prayers that Jesus had made during the course of his lifetime, times like the pr one that uh, John's Gospel uh, presents right here, that this was his frequent um, meditation and decision in his life, 
we know that the temptation scene, which the which the other Gospels uh, present as in a very stylized fashion at the beginning of his ministry, went on throughout his life. He was constantly tempted to adopt another kind of role other than the one that he was sure that the Father had for him. That in the same way that that same temptation he had to struggle with and overcome constantly. No, I'm not going to ask to be saved from this hour. It was mm -hmm. for this hour that I came, and that therefore. What John's Gospel has here is a reflection of the prayer that happened many times in Jesus' life. Let me tell you what comes to my mind as you're saying that. that we, we find here there a, a wonderful model for us. In other words, we can't wait to deal with the moment yeah, of death exactly. right when it comes or when the doctor tells us it's going to come or something. But this is sort of a lifelong practice. As many of the philosophers have said, we prepare for our death all the way along the line. That would suggest that in the culture as a whole, we would need to talk more about death. And in religious education, we would need to do that. That these courses on death and dying are very valuable things. And that part of our prayer life all the way along the line ought to be, can I accept this. Uh, Lord, help me to learn to submit to your will so that I would begin to prepare myself. So what I'm getting out of what you said about Ray Brown is that this became Jesus' sort of constant attitude, right? Yes, yes. And that therefore when the moment of crisis came, he was ready for it because he had prepared for it. Exactly, exactly. It's a whole stance toward our life to repeat the same like a broken record. Either, either our life is for ourselves and for our own enjoyment or for somehow it's for something beyond us, for God our Father, for the people he gave us to love. Yeah, and, I, and then, boy, that really uh, sets it up. I mean, it shows the great pastoral relevance and the great relevance for our own spiritual life of this kind of passage. Ken, was there anything else that you wanted to say about John 12, 20 to 33 that seemed important to you? He does go on to say you get that same pathos later on. Father, he says, my soul is troubled now, yet what should I say? Father, save me from this hour, but it was for this hour that, for this that I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. That's right. It sort of makes the same point, I guess, in a graphic way. Exactly. And it's interesting that he ends up the passage then by alluding again. This, this is, happens to be the last thing that Jesus says in his public ministry in John's Gospel. And it brings out, just as in the synoptics, the last discourse brings in again the apocalyptic imagery of the end of the world and so forth. Jesus puts his life and his death in that same kind of context by his giving his life. The, he will be raised up. The prince of this world will be cast down. A if we understand the, the prince of this world as signifying a, a, an approach to life whereby power is the important thing, getting and having and making other things, uh, other people do what I want, then Jesus' self-giving is exactly the thing that overcomes that and creates a new reality for us. Ken, thank you very much. I, you know, I always appreciate you, the way you deal with the scriptures. You have a great scholarly background and also a, a light way of wearing that and making it practical. So we've tried to look at the problem of death, and clearly the agony in the garden of Jesus shows us the proper stance towards it. Not my will, but thine be done. You've been listening to Reflections with theologian Father James Basic, lecturer and campus minister at the University of Toledo. Today, Father Basic talked with Father Kenneth Mormon, theologian and secretary, priest personnel board for the Diocese of Toledo. The topic of this week's Reflections was the agony in the garden facing the mystery of death. If you have any comments on today's show or suggestions for future programs, please write Father James Basic, Catholic Campus Minister, 2086 Brookdale Drive, Toledo, Ohio, 43606. Funding for this program was provided by the Catholic Communications Commission of the Diocese of Toledo. Music